against it. So, All right, welcome back. Apologies for a little delay there. We got overloaded with brain power. This is the first time that I think I've ever, Neil, done a threesome. All right, here we go. It's me, you, and John Malden. <laughs> Two titans, wily veterans. John, John, you look awesome. I lo- like the pink shirt. And um, well, I'm is, I'm living in the island, so I've got to try to you know exude a little island presence here. I like that. I like that. He looks good. Neil always looks yeah. good. We're not going to play a guessing your age game here. We're going to uh, probably <laughs> what what you guys were talking because we had a little bit of a delay. I was listening to these guys talk, and I hear Malden say that there's a proctology private equity situation going on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you weren't paying attention. I said we were talking about the reason I'm wearing a pink shirt today and a, and a jacket is I've got this whole closet full of suits and jackets and shirts and nice stuff, and I never wear them because I'm always wearing shorts and a T-shirt because, you know, I'm out going to the gym. It's the islands. I live in Puerto Rico, for those who don't know. And uh, I said, Lord and Taylor's and men's warehouse went bankrupt. Uh, and I'm thinking it's probably private equity, but if they were depending on me to ever buy another suit, I mean, I've got 20 suits up in my closet that I'd never wear. <laughs> and, you know, until we can actually go out and start on the speaking circuit again, um, you know, uh, I don't know if Neil will ever wear a suit again, even, e- I, even when you're on, on uh, <laughs> no. This is a, I think I got, Brooks Brothers made a white and folding up. So yeah, I, Neil Neil would never. Well, let's wear. let's I, get into smart, our show here. As long as I've known Neil, he's never had a tie on, not once. And um, my suit, I'm wearing shorts with my suit jacket. So there you go with that. I mean, but this is a bigger. This is obviously a, a way to traverse the discussion about debt. Um, a lot of people think, particularly private equity. Uh, don't forget, we have my from my one of my old colleagues from Carlisle. Uh, who I effectively call P.E. Powell, uh, sponsors and aids and abets this whole thing. I mean, these guys think that they can buy, they can put debt on anything and it's never going to go down in price. Now, where would you go? Maybe give uh, you know, uh, John the first shot at that and you guys can go back and forth because I think that this has become just the risk that just won't go away, but everybody seemingly thinks that it's gone away. I think we're in what the... Uh, Bank of International Settlements called a debt trap. And by that, I mean, the they said that your debt gets so big that it becomes overwhelming and it begins to slow down growth. And so you have a policy response, which generally involves borrowing more money. You get a short term boost, but now you've increased your debt, which slows your growth down more, which means that you've got to borrow more money which slows down your debt. You you get in this cycle and it's called a debt trap. And um, when I first started talking about the concept of the great reset, uh, you know, 10 years ago, eight years ago, because you could see we're building up debt and we're going to have to resolve it in some way. Uh, And I remember in 2019, I was writing that, you know, debt was going to be 38 trillion uh, by the end of 2030. And now the CBO came out last, you know, three weeks ago that said it'll be there, you know, agreeing with me. So I'm, I was no longer the while. I'm now saying I now think it's c- going to be closer to 50 trillion. But we're I presumed when I said great reset that we would have a debt trap. That's a, that's an underlying assumption. And now we're here. We're in a debt trap. There's no matter who's elected, they're going to be confronted with a three trillion dollar deficit next year. There's there's no way out of it. I mean, um, when mess up, you get a four trillion dollar debt <laughs> deficit, yeah. I guess. But there's a, there, but there's no there's no end to it, Neil. And, and when you overlay this with your your demographic view, you're the one and only uh, Neil Howe, after all, on this. I mean, how do you get out of it? I think I, I got one one little like a little hint here that people think that they have. It's a visual for you here, up and down. You know, this is the you know the the MMT book. But I mean, what do you what do you think? Well, I, I think ultimately you just have to rewrite the political rules of the game, uh, you know, uh, and that has revolutionary implications for our political system and our economy. I went 
spent the last couple of days actually parsing very carefully through the CBO's long-term economic and fiscal projections. The economic projections alone were just as alarming as the fiscal. I mean, it basically shows a, uh, a continual slowing down of real GDP growth decade after decade, going all the way into the 2040s. A lot of that is predetermined by demographic growth. Uh, you know, the, the, the growth of the labor force is going to slow to almost absolute zero by the 2030s. I mean, boomers are getting older, they're retiring, we have these very small generations following them. And it's been accelerated by a number of other trends that we've seen. One is continuing decline in the fertility rate of young adults. You know, millennials have just simply failed to <laughs> have more kids throughout the entire recovery from 2009 all the way to 2019, there was only one year, 2014, with a slight uptick in the TFR, the total fertility rate. Every other year has been down. In 2020, we're gonna be down, you know, to what used to be the level of Germany. We're gonna be down around 1.53, 1.54. So that's gonna be, you know, a huge hurdle down the road. Our immigration is beginning to slow down. Uh, our death rate is actually bad news there. We're actually living less long. Uh, you know, we're less healthy than we think. And meanwhile, productivity is continuing slowing down. And, and uh, this is partly due to declining capital formation, partly due to the crowding out of debt. And I, I, I believe in the debt trap scenario, but it's also due to just declining dynamism in the American economy. There's so many sectors which are roped off to innovation through regulatory reasons, through economies of scale. I think of healthcare, education, social services, uh, construction, all these things with negative or, or, or flat productivity growth over time. This is becoming a larger and larger share of our economy. This is the Balmol cost disease and we're in the midst of it. So a decline, in, a combination of declining capital formation, declining business dynamism, and, and basically a demographic contraction, which is kind of surprising on the low side. I mean, we knew obviously the boomers are gonna retire. A lot of that was already baked in the cake, but it's continuing to surprise on the low side. And so you have this, the pandemic, this huge sudden increase in debt, and that'll be added to in the first couple of dec you know, first couple of years in the 2020s, and then what happens with that? Well, the CBO is very optimistically assuming that real interest rates are gonna go down to practically zero throughout the 2020s, despite a robust recovery. And I know John and I have talked about that. I find that a complete inconsistency. CBO has to get it right. You either, you either put your horses all on one barn, right? Either you assume a fast recovery, but in which case real interest rates are gonna be higher or assume very low real interest rates, fine, but then assume a completely stagnating economy and very little growth throughout the 2020s, perhaps even worse than we had, you know, in the, in the, in, over the last decade. And I think they're, they're straddling that. Anyway, that's, that's my one uh, problem with uh, the CBO outlook right now. Uh, it could be worse. I mean, they're projecting 200% of GDP by the year, uh, uh, 2050. Uh, that's up from 150. That's that's up from 150. Well, here's the interesting. And, 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 and that's, that's that's a joke. But let me that, you, finish up your wait, question, wait, and then wait, I want to jump John, in. I, I know your answer. I know what you're going to say about that. What I'm interested <laughs> in is the delta over time. Just last year in 2019, it was 150. Now it's 200. That's 50 percentage points up in just one year. So uh, I agree with you. It's you know, a, a do nothing scenario for a future is going to be much higher than that because you're going to get this downward spiral. But anyway, that's that's kind of how I look at it, Keith. Go ahead. John. Okay, then coming back in, Keith. If, if I could jump in, first of all, the delta comes from one reason alone: the CBO never assumes a recession, and so. Yeah, but they also plane off that they plane off the peaks. You know, they they take a long term average. They 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 do, but they never assume a recession. And all of this delta in their change came from that recession. I mean, that or the recession we're in. Number one, yeah, number number two, come into your productivity. We have milked most of the industries where we can get productivity 
uh, we've already milked them. I mean, it's hard to get more productivity out of restaurants and service industries and hotels. I mean, you can get some slight uh, productivity gains, uh, but it, I mean, the healthcare is ripe for productivity gains, but the other industries you mentioned, there's, it's just hard to get productivity gains out of construction. A little bit here, a little bit there, but it, it's tough. Now, coming back to the CBO projections, what I what we did in my letter two weeks ago, my, my free newsletter, Malden Economics, Thoughts from the Frontline, you know, 20 years, I mean, I'm in my 21st year now, so I'll pump that a little bit. Thank you for even putting it up there. Yay, Keith. Um, <laughs> the, what, I, what I said, let's make the assumption, using CBOs, I think optimistic growth assumptions, and using their interest assumptions, which I agree with you, Keith, uh, I mean, Neil, is, uh, does, doesn't make sense. But I said, what if this recovery looks more like the Great Recession recovery, rather than recovering in six to nine months, like the CBO is projecting? So this monstrous V-shaped recovery, it looks, you know, four years. Well, all of a sudden, you take that, you assume a 2% real growth in spending, which is what we've been doing forever, you take you have to add in the off budget deficits, which does in fact add to total debt, and you get to 50 trillion by 2030. And so, you know, when you talk about they're projecting 200% of debt to GDP by uh, 2050, we're going to have 200% of uh, debt to GDP uh, sometime, you know, within the next 10 years. Well, Keith, you don't you don't want me to go down the rabbit hole of on budget versus off budget spending. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the reality is that people, to to people don't like give a shit about the CBO E. I mean, or the CBO or I mean, they they care about economic gravity. And if you guys are right on economic gravity, whether it be demographically or from the burden that is debt, I mean, Reinhardt and Rogoff proved this using a long history. Uh, you know, triple digit debt to GDP or double digit deficit. We're, we're, you're basically there, right? So, so the real question is like, I think is just that is like the shape of this bloody recovery. It's easy for people that don't do macro to come up with a letter in the alphabet. Um, but now I think, I guess, you know, you, the most appropriate level letter is probably K anyway. That's not even a linear K where rich people got uh, a lot richer mm -hmm. and a lot more people got poor. How does this, how does this, how does this go? Like, I mean, most people, the stock market is basically right back to the all time highs. How, how does this go? Is this just aim and, you know, end with this, which is, hey, guys, haha, we haven't tried the spending that can pick up the slack, and now we're going to print more of it, and we're going to do more of it. I mean, it looks like we're on that railway track. So, you know, my uh, let me just uh, let me just an initial uh, whack at this. Um, uh, I think the one danger I see, because I do think we're gravitating toward modern monetary theory, absolutely, you know, as the... <laughs> That the author of that book, you know, lays forth, and it's basically debt is free, and you know the CBO is basically saying debt is free. I mean, the real rate of interest is going to be lower than the growth rate of the economy. It basically means you can, you know, you're in the land of helicopter. You'd be stupid not to borrow, right? If you can actually pay it back in a smaller share of GDP than what you borrowed, right? Um, and so I think that we're moving there. And uh, I see the, the way it's going to end is, uh, is inflationary pressure. Uh, and I never said that back, you know, coming out of 2009, 2010, 2011. I didn't think we were moving in that direction. But I see that. I see that politically where we're headed. I see that there's a consensus on both sides. And when I see Democrats and Republicans both gravitating in the same direction on something, I just say that's the path of least resistance. Everyone's going to move there. And everyone's saying we can't create inflation. Of course we can create inflation. You know, the Fed's just going to pump money into everyone's bank account every month if we have to. Uh, you know, it's the equivalent of helicopter money. Yes, we can create inflation. And of course, that puts an end to it, right? I mean, that puts an end to everything. You know, then the Fed has to react. You know, then, then we're in a completely new ball game. And even the monetary, you know, modern monetary, the, the MMT crowd, they say, yeah, that's kind of when you have to pull back. <laughs> is when you actually see inflation hitting you in the face, right? I mean, even they're on board with that. Okay, let me push back a little bit. 
uh, right now we are, if you want to call it printing money, we're using quantitative easing and it shows back up on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserves and it's not really hot money in the way that MMT is hot money. The Fed is not putting money in the uh, uh, bank accounts of uh, people. The federal government under fiscal policy is doing it. They go into the market, they borrow money, and then the Federal Reserve buys those whatever bonds it needs to. And so they are, they are in fact a player, but it is a different aspect. And that is not necessarily inflationary. The fiscal policy is, but the, the debt is, the debt is going to end up being deflationary unless Congress in its infinite ignorance can't see the difference between quantitative easing and modern monetary theory. And they decide, well, we're, we want the Fed and we're going to change the law. We want the Fed to actually put money directly into the treasury account or to actually put money into individuals account. And at that point, I will not have enough gold. <laughs> and, no, that's, and, that's, and, and neither will you or neither will all of us will wish we had bought more gold back in the 2000s when it was 300. And, and I had to confess uh, on Twitter the other day that, you know, by, I, I got lucky when I bought my gold. I really did. It was cheap. And it's grown so that, you know, I think you should have gold in the three to five percent range of your portfolio. It's central bank insurance. Uh, it's not an investment for me. And so my gold has grown in proportion just because it, the price went up. But if I, they start talking about actual, you know, MMT, I will start buying gold at no matter what price it is, because I'm going to need a lot more central bank insurance. Well, I, John, that's where I think I think that's where we're headed. I mean, uh, this is going to be all deficit funded, everything from a Green New Deal to a minimum guaranteed income, right? I mean, you know, we're going to have that, and and it's going to be the government spending, putting that money directly into the hands of people who will be spending, or or contractors who will be, you know, paying their employees. I think that's where we're going because the lesson is over the past 15 years is that there's no penalty for borrowing, right? Well, the, the, the Republican, the part of the Republican party that were the uh, deficit hawks literally left the house. I mean, I, something like 40, 45 Republicans have resigned from Congress and the ones, the four or five from Texas that I knew personally were all deficit hawks and they resigned. And they were in districts they could win. It's, it's just like they threw their hands up and said, we can't take this anymore. Um, and I, I was very, you know, upset with, you know, Hensarling leaving and, and others. There's no, you know, deficit hawk wing or, or, or a small one in, in the Republican Party. No, and, there's, just, there's just a Freedom Caucus in the House and they're totally pro-Trump, you know, and, uh, when, and they enforce their orthodoxy and they have nothing really as principled against deficits. This is no longer the Tea Party. This is no longer even, you know, the group who stood up during the GW Bush administration, although you could see where Republicans are going back there, right? Right. Um, well, Keith, change, change us on, get us on a different topic. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, everybody gets upset now because it didn't end, John. You know, like it's so it's like you, know, you got your debt trap. You have debt as far as the eye can see. If you replace the S&P 500 with five companies, then it's all good. You look at the broader swath of the economy. Guys on slide 76, I'm curious as to how you, and this kind of gets back to the, to, the, to the pink shirt or the not wearing suits point, which is you know, a lot of companies, the rate of change of profits, we're looking at NIPA profits here versus the S&P 500. There's a, the, the gap is as wide as it's ever been and it's widening at its fastest rate. Because if you go to the next slide, you see the FANG revenue and profit growth on a CAGR or just looking back, you know, this year uh, with COVID, you know, there's, there's basically, you know, this hollowing out of the large majority of either human beings, uh, which is disgusting um, and really sad, or, you know, the large swath of, of, of employers in this country, which are small 
medium-sized businesses. So, you know, that, you know, again, like, is that, is, isn't the answer to that? I, I can't get away from it, guys. Like, uh, these are big bank charts, right? And most people that walk around saying, ha-ha, the market's up, you know, you, you, you guys short of junk, you're an idiot. Um, they, they quite literally are making fun of, of people talking about things like this. And, and I'm wondering, I think a lot of people wonder, like, could it, could it start ending, like, today? Like, could the market, like, literally crash Well, tomorrow? I don't think it's to, I don't, I don't think, I'm going to come to your question, and I'm going to come to a, a conversation that Neil and I have had for 20 years now. Because um, I could never see how we got to this revolutionary period, this real pain at the end of the fourth turning. For, where does it come from? Uh, it's going to come from this accumulated debt. It's going to come from when you start seeing this debt and you get into a debt trap, what a consequences of that is you get the marginal rate of, of, of production or project project begins to reduce. And so your marginal rate on um, money drives up so that you will get low interest rates, uh, Neil, but you're also going to get lower um, uh, growth. So uh, you're, we become Japan, we become Europe. Further, your marginal rate of, of productivity on weight on labor is going to drop, which means that you're either going to have less labor or lower wages, and that's going to produce significant angst and frustration. And all of that's coming in in the mid to late twenties, and we get your fourth turning big bang moment. Yeah, I and 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 that's just that's that's quite scary to me. I, I agree. So on the debt side, particularly you know, anything that's denominated, you know, in nominal terms, you know, gets hit by inflation expectations. But then on the equity side, it gets hit by the rising share of income going to labor. You know, that's been going one way now for 30 years. It's going to go the other way. Every fourth turning in history, every period of crisis like this that combines politics with the economy always is an equalizing moment. We saw that in the 1930s and early 40s. We saw that in the Civil War. We've seen, we've seen this repeated. We saw that during the very formation of this country. These are always equalizing moments. And so you're gonna see Congress come in there. You're gonna see the $15 pretty soon with a little bit of inflation will be $20 minimum wage, but we'll see all these efforts to push that up and uh, so that is going to be, and, and there's nothing like that, that, that share rising to pull down that, that, uh, that rate of return you're talking about, Keith, on equity. So it's going to be on both sides. And you can see how all of this is going to be a more, that's going to be kind of the plus side, right? Yeah, I mean, it'll be, be more people, equalizing. Yeah, the, uh, the, the answer that the market bulls, perma, perma bulls say, or people that work in, you know, we've literally, we've people running money in this country, big money, that are saying that we're going to fix high yield spreads. Stocks are not going to ever go down again. We have, you know, populist movements on that, that stocks only go up. But on the slide 80 is what you guys are actually talking about, which is, you know, pretty basic relationship, which is a long term relationship between labor and capital. Um, so the black line's now coming down, like to, you know, to, to John's point, you know, the Lord and Taylor and the men's warehouse is going away uh, and the black line's falling and the blue line is the people it's rising for the first time going all the way back. And that's, that's you know, so to me, that like, and that's what John, that's what you said too, right? Your incremental return on that incremental hire is falling because your profits are falling, so you're not going to hire somebody. So now the government's got to pay, I think literally in this book she says, why don't we hire people to do things that we all think would be socially a good thing to do? Like, from waving at boats to walking my dog, I would totally be on in sync with that if I was a socialist. But I mean, these are like, you, I don't know. I mean, I can't get away from it. You can't get away from it. it it's the kind of thing that would start a revolution, I, I assume. I mean, that isn't what the fourth turning, you know, you, you end with these types of dynamics? Well, it is. And, and at the same time, though, usually you, you push the economy structurally and... Uh, you know, technologically, even legally, into a new framework. And that opens up huge new possibilities. Get rid of some of the big incumbents. Watch them fall, you know, regulate away their competition and create space for new competitors. That would raise the marginal return on new capital, which has seen the most devastating decline. There's nothing you can explain, particularly over the last 15 years, 
then this extremely low, razor low rate of kind of, you know, risk-free real rate of return on marginal capital and the enormous rates of return on incumbent companies. Except to say, our economy is no longer competitive. No one can compete with the incumbents. And of course, Wall Street is happy about that. <laughs> Their yeah. money is resting with the incumbents, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, Jamie, Jamie Dimon today said, look at our deposits. Longer. He's like, look at all the money we have in deposits. Jamie Dimon saying this today. I'm like, oh, Lord Dimon, thank God you got all the money. The government put the money here, and it's in their accounts. But it's 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 an amazing thing to watch. I mean, at the end of the day, all this means, like, it, it probably means that you have, like, a Jap you know, Japanese yield curve, and the banks in the U.S. aren't worth a heck of a lot either anymore. And so that's a big part of the establishment, is that the, the you, you will never hear a Wall Street banker say anything remotely close to what we've you know, talked about here in, in 30 minutes. And we can talk a lot more about that. But is that what you mean by institutions? The actual link between, like, as John pointed out, the, the Treasury, the Fed, the banks? Well, I, I, I basically mean the, 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 uh, the, 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 the chai ball, the, the in, kind of industrial network that props up these bigger and bigger winners, you see them now, particularly in uh, high tech and Silicon yeah. Valley, right? Yeah, good and, point. and there's obvious reasons why the pandemic has accelerated that, but they've, they've just taken over. Uh, well, you've got both parties that favor a head-on assault again. That's already underway on the Trump administration. You've got both the FTC and the, and the antitrust division of the Justice Department going to work out that. You can imagine how that's gonna be accelerated under a Biden administration. And both sides, I mean, whether it's, uh, you know, Josh Hawley or any of these guys on the Republican side, they'll be just, they'll be wanting to bring in their bats as well. Uh, I think we're going to go in a very different direction, Keith. And I think a lot of the assumptions we make about the big winners on the S&P staying, you know, just thriving and getting bigger forever, I don't think it's going to last. Hmm. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. And and so is the, the point that you're you, making, John, if you that look all... At, if you ahead. look at... Go ahead. Well, I mean, if you look at the S&P 495, they've gone nowhere to down. You you start moving further down the uh, food chain, there there's actual bear markets going on out there. Um, they still I mean, exist. It, we're seeing the we're seeing the growth in in, in smaller names, and if uh, Neil is right, they start going after those bigger names, then uh, it will create a bear market. Now, the Let's switch since uh, Neil is assuming that Biden's going to win. I think that, I think I heard that assumption uh, in, in your underlying statement. I just uh, threw out out there as a purely. <laughs> purely but, I mean, let's let's look let's look at what. Uh, and by the way, either side has three plus trillion dollar uh, uh, deficits. Uh, both sides have the same problem. Um, they both they'll have different approaches. But Biden's promise is going to raise taxes. If he puts in that Social Security tax over 400,000, that means self-employed people are paying, you know, 13.8% uh, over 400,000. And then you add your state taxes and all the other stuff. I mean, you're talking about uh, a lot of, you know, wealthier self-employed companies, uh, uh, which hire a lot of people. These people are now going to uh, uh, start seeing a marginal rate of, you know, 60, 65 percent in a lot of states. That will never happen because the if you go back to 1986 and we've probably talked about this, Neil, there was a huge rise in personal income in 1986 and Thomas Piketty was talking about the disparity of, of uh, between wages and income. And he didn't even mention in his chart that he was showing that, you know, there's just, in 1986, there's this jump and then it moves on. It was all about people moving from C corps where they were sheltering their money to sub S corps because the marginal rate went down. Now you wanted to be in a sub S corporation. I did that literally hundreds of thousands of businesses did that. Now in America, if Biden, if they get their full, here's what we promised to do, tax things, the, even if they raise corporate tax rates to 
it'll be half of the marginal personal rate. Every LLC small business will turn around and they will uh, immediately reverse and they'll become a, 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 a C corporation and they'll just let their money ride in that. Um, so nobody is, no corporation, no self-employed person is going to be paying that marginal rate at 70% or whatever it would be in California. It'll just be, we're just going to check the box differently under, you know, we'll talk to our lawyer, we'll spend a thousand dollars, we'll get a new corporation and we'll put it all in there. It, it is, it, it's harder to shear sheep than it looks like. Um, <laughs> and, and they're not going to, they're not going to be as, as successful at it, which is going to frustrate them. And they're going to want to change the rules yet again. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, John, because you started talking uh, you started talking at the beginning of this discussion about this intolerable debt and this incredible debt path we're on. And I will say <clears throat> that thanks in part to Donald Trump, in 2019, we went into that year. That turned out to be the final year of our recovery with a 5% of GDP deficit, right? Oh, was, I, don't, don't, fourth, don't get me. That was I'm not defending Donald Trump's that record. Was the fourth highest in post-war history, right? At the, worse. It was terrible, terrible, terrible. Story. We were going in with a 5% of GDP deficit, right? I think that points to the problem, right? Even in the best year we can imagine in the last 15 years, we couldn't come within that magnitude of actually balancing the budget. So, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, uh, you know, you're faced with some options. And one of them, I think, and questionably, is going to be raising taxes. It's also going to be cutting low priority spending. Uh, but, you know, to do that, we'll have to talk about health care. You yeah, don't well, want to go there, do you? I, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't we, only so. have, uh, we only have 10 minutes left, and we can take some questions. And health care, to me, is like All listening right. to or okay. watching paint dry. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, We'll give the first one to John, and thanks for your questions. They'll, they're voted on. So this is the second highest ranked question, Dean in Chicago. Uh, John, and I don't know if you said this or not, John, so sometimes people say I say things that I didn't say, so clear it up if you didn't. Um, John, <laughs> John, it's amazing how that works. Uh, John, in March, you drastically shifted to begrudgingly embracing massive fiscal stimulus as a necessary to prevent a collapse of the markets and the economy. Um, from an MMT perspective, if fiscal is effective and necessary in crisis, why not use it all the time? Well, because we're not in a crisis all the time, number one. And uh, I would probably lean, if you're asking me personally, and nobody has, um, <laughs> I would lean more towards the Republican Senate side of preferring to have less fiscal stimulus. But I would write those unemployment checks for people that, for no fault of their own, because of lockdowns, they're out of a job. Mm -hmm. And to me, it, I mean, I know technically it doesn't come under the takings clause, but we've taken a lot of jobs. Um, and I think it's fair that we write checks. Now, to Neil's point, we started at a 5% uh, uh, de tax deficit when it, you know, so yes. I, I, I don't know what else you can do. I mean, you can't leave. We, we've already got a massive problem with people uh, being homeless. Uh, I mean, I've talked with friends, Mark Yusko and others that have been driving across the country, and they see it in every sit little city, every major city they go to. Uh, we're going to have to take care of people for a while, and that's why the next president, whoever it is, is going to be writing bigger checks than any of us would feel comfortable with, but we have a crisis and it's going to take some time to dig out of it. Now, I believe we can. I believe entrepreneurs who've lost their businesses, 100,000 of them probably going to end up being 200,000 before it's over, they still have that entrepreneurial uh, DNA in their body. They'll start another business, but it takes capital and time. Uh, it's not like starting an engine and the profits start coming in. And it's, it's slow, but we get there. But that's why I think it's going to be closer to 
the Great Recession recovery, where it took us four years to get back to, uh, you know, the original 2007 year. I think so. And I'll be it'll be 2024 before we get back to 2020, 2019. But as as long as we don't do something fiscally stupid, and I might argue that raising taxes in the teeth of a recession. Now, if you want to raise taxes and then postpone actually implementing them for two or three years, then fine, you can get away with it. But it's going to be a problem. Now, a lot of people say so, that, Neil, what, what John just said. Um, I, I'll say the same thing. I mean, if you are going to spend $500 billion, then give it to people with no, with no roof over their head and can't feed their kids. I'm totally on board with that. And, and, and guess what? You know, why are we printing money to buy junk bonds instead? Like, the, there's, a, there's a trade-off. And that's actually right. one solution with MMT. If you're going to do it and you're, not, and you're saying you're not doing it, let's just do it and let's reallocate. <laughs> it's the way they think about it. Because then you'd have some jobless junk, fund, junk bond managers, but at least you'd have some, some, some homeless people that can, can, can have a chance. Yeah, well, you know, what's the matter with helicopter money? <laughs> you know. We already and, have it. In, in a sense, what, what you oh, really come want on. to do, what you really want to do is, is have the transfers, uh, you know, going to the people who need it, right? and kind of rectifying this huge imbalance that we've seen in, in our society over the past you know, eight months, if, if not longer. And then you also want to get more revenue at the same time. And basically the transfer will be, I mean, I hate to say it because I'm gonna sound like Bernie Sanders and no one's ever accused me of doing that. <laughs> but you wanna take people from people who are older with a higher net worth and you're essentially transferring it to those with you know, we're younger with lower net worth and simultaneously as inflation expectations accelerate, you're going to be taking those who are creditors and going to go into debtors. Now, this is a this is a dynamic and it typically historically occurs at the same time. Right. This is how you kind of shift the kind of political kind of the political economic balance. Big it's time. not going to be pretty. Uh, well, here well it, and it won't work because what you're asking Okay, there is, I, I got to keep coming back. There's a significant difference between helicopter money and quantitative easing. What the Federal Reserve is doing, and you brought it up, Keith, John, I'm not buying, junk, bu borrowing, bu buying junk bonds, uh, corporate bonds, I, I can't even tell you how upset that makes me. <laughs> if they want to do, I don't even like them buying mortgage bonds. I mean, if they want to buy government debt, fine, buy government debt, but don't mess around with the marketplace. Don't buy high yield bonds for God's sake. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that shouldn't be their well, role. You, you know, the Fed, the Fed and the Treasury got around this with a little bit of uh, uh, legal hanky panky, right? They got around that barrier so the Fed could, in a sense, conduit money into these uh into yeah. you know buying you know corporate debt high yield debt and all that that's actually the fed is not supposed to go there right uh but i'm not talking about that i agree with you i mean that's futile we, we should stop doing that i'm talking about spending the money of the people who need it agreed totally agreed alone and you're going to have to raise revenues on the those people who can afford it and yeah. How you do that, how you deal with the incentive effects, that's the risk. You deal with that by using a VAT, which we won't be willing to do until we actually have your fourth turning true crisis. When, when we get into a crisis for which we now all admit there are no good choices, we all agree that we've got to raise a bigger percentage um, closer to Europe of our national GDP will do what they did, which is we'll go to a, a, a pretty high VAT, 18, 20%. It'll be, you know, and we'll have um, income taxes. We could, we could drop the income tax rate, but over 20% over 100,000 to a million with no deductions for anything. I mean, you know, from a million to 10 million, 25%. Um, oh. So you don't, you don't change the incentive 
and the people at the lower end who would be paying the VAT, then you give them uh, in, uh, checks to offset their portion of the VAT. Now, this, is, this is Milton Friedman, negative income tax. And I'll have to say, Larry Kalikov has always agreed with you, right? What you oh, want yeah. to do, I mean, the VAT penalizes the older people because they're still spending, even though they are not earning. And, and I agree with you on the overall tilt of that arrangement. Uh, VAT combined with, uh, you're going to need some sort of estate tax. You're going to need something in the in that range as well that we've kind of gotten rid of. But I agree with you. Uh, that plus a little whiff of inflation, ah, that's enough to really start changing things in this country, Keith. Well, I mean, big time. I mean, well, uh, let's posit that this, this, this is a big question that Raul Paul actually in the prior conversation elicited plenty of uh, response, what, which, which is this. Well, what happens if you have VAT, MMT, KMNME, whatever you want to call it? It's government planning. Okay, you got big central planning as a solution to gravity. This I don't agree with. For the record, everybody knows that. I, I, I don't believe that that's the answer. Um, but what if, and here's the, here's the question, you know, wait on it, Floyd from Wisconsin, you know, Raul po posed an interesting question. What if MMT doesn't generate inflation? What if it comes out as deflation? That's not how it works. Not how it works. So, that, that, I mean, it, it's, an, it's an erroneous assumption. I mean, that's a big what if, and it makes a great science fiction novel, but it's not reality. <laughs> yeah. so if, if, if MMT were to work, for instance, if simply the, 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 the Treasury Department going into everyone's pay, you know, through all these uh, automated payroll systems, there must be about four or five of them, which, you know, operate most of the nation's businesses, and you simply inflated everyone's, you know, payroll 10% every month, I guarantee you, you get inflation, right? I mean, everyone would just have more money to spend. And uh, there are ways that the government. But we'd, look, can we'd end up looking like Venezuela or well, Argentina. Now, so. Okay. Now, now you're like, you know, now it's too far. Before you couldn't do it. But that's not my point. My point is the government can, if it really put its mind to it, generate inflation. Almost. Oh, no question. Certainly it can do that. So anyway, that, and basically MMT. But we, would have to change, but we would have to change the laws, the Federal Reserve Act, in order to. Uh, no, the Treasury will do it. The Treasury will do it, and then the the, the Fed will just buy up, you know, the the debt and and and, 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 and that makes us look like Japan with okay. no inflation, deflation, no, and no growth. That. Japan never guaranteed inflation like that. That was the problem. Oh, they Even kept well, economics they kept, never did. They that. they kept trying to get inflation, and they never no, got they, it because they, they never implemented. They were never going to buck the business establishment, they were going to ever upset existing institutions in the way that MMT is proposed. But Europe actually does write checks to their citizens. The country of France, the country of Italy has massive subsidies. Then they go to the bond market, they borrow the money, and the ECB buys those bonds. So it's a different mechanism, but it ends with the same result. You end up with low inflation and low growth. And I'm, high VATs. What I'm talking about, John, is giving the money directly to people who almost certainly spend almost all of it. Okay, that's how you guarantee uh, inflation if you really are determined to create it. I think I think that's what Bernanke would say to the Japanese and does say for twenty-five thousand bucks an hour or something like that or a nice lunch. Hey, uh, you just didn't do enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you guys are you guys just aren't like I was. And well, that's, you, but that's the that's the go-to answer for every Keynesian. Okay. <laughs> Our, our solution didn't work because you didn't do it hard enough. Exactly. You should have done more of it. Now, you got, <laughs> now if, you're, if you're a raging like Bernanke, um, you know, going back to the prior gold high, guys, pull up the ch chart 88. I think a lot of people just in terms of awareness aren't really aware of what the dollar has been worth historically, um, up, up and down, the purchasing power of what you work for. Um, but again, back to 2011, this guy was vigilant. I mean, coming from the 2000 high, so there's two highs in this chart. Not coincidentally, uh, the dollar peaked at both tech bubble highs. Um, but again, from those highs, the question is what happens next from this high? From that high, you went from, from 2000, 2001. By 2011, as, as you well know, John, you know, Ber the Bernank had devalued the dollar to a basically its, its big time cycle lows. Gold hit at that point a local in dollars all time high, and so did commodities. That was inflation, right? And Bernanke didn't whisper the words dollar or inflation at all. Uh, and got away with it. And that's like 
to me, that gives scope. That chart gives scope, like, i.e., the chart can go down a lot. Um, and that would, that, would, uh, that would mean that inflation would go up a lot. It's, it's, you, you saw it go down. The United States uh, had more fiscal stimulus than almost any other advanced industrial country, right? I mean, just like in 2009, when we were out, kind of out front there. Yep. We've been doing this massive fiscal stimulus. But the problem is, and the dollar responded. The dollar went down. Precious metals went up. I mean, all the usual stuff. But the problem is then stimulus stalled, right? And that's kind of where the market is right now, right? Because we didn't get stimulus four, five, six, seven, right? We're kind yeah. of waiting to resolve the political question. But I think that's once it's resolved and once we go into our second afterburner stage, right? You get the new stimulus package put in there. Count on that dollar beginning its continued onward descent. Well, go back to the one point on that. And again, I remember this point, And I think, John, you remember this point. I mean, since you started... Um, uh, it was 21 years ago, right? Uh, you're, you started writing. 21 years I've been at this. <laughs> right. I mean, but I, I mean, yeah. when I was, well, I, was I, I wrote before then, but this, this particular version of, of my writing started 21 years ago. Yeah. Right. And I remember in 2008 when I was starting Hedge, I mean, you're one of the only people calling it like it is on this front. And everybody was begging for more cowbell, not on the order of cowbell that we have now, stimulus type, you know, part two, three and four. Uh, but when they didn't get it, Look what the dollar did. I mean, there's that dollar spike, unfortunately, that Bernanke had to fight off all the way to the 2011 lows, like Neil said. And you know, you, there there can be episodic periods of dollar, you know, dollar-based deflation where the market's begging for the stimulus is so forceful that the expectation on the other side of not getting it is what creates the ultimate collapse. I mean. Buffett even said in October of 08 that this this was going to be the the big thing. You got to buy stocks. I mean, we're kind of at that point on on a much or, or, well. We're not kind of. We are at that point in terms of much more leverage in the system, much more market cap, and way more people participating on the upside of it for now. And and it is probably one of the. We're setting ourselves up for a really potential problematic uh, period of volatility. And as we go further into this recession, as earnings don't happen the way everybody is expecting, as the even with vaccines, which I believe we're going to have, I mean, I think in April, when we start seeing the new vaccines that are uh, not based on the old platforms. We're going to see some novel stuff that will blow our minds. I mean, the Corona uh, thing uh, has done, COVID thing has done one thing for us, and that's really taught us that we can work together internationally, we can work together corporately, and we can do new creative stuff. We're going to come up with some novel ways to. Um, cure flus and colds and, and other things like that. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Yep. However, the it's still going to take a lot of time. There's not going to be near as much profits as people think there, there's going to be. And profits are the mother's milk of the stock market. And at some point, you can you know, you know you can keep telling people, well, we're going to make profits someday. Well, someday. They're going to wake up and people will say, it's just someday, it's just right about now. And uh, they're going to be looking for other opportunities. It, 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 you know, now, then again, maybe the CBO is right. Maybe it is a the shortest recession on record and we get a V shaped recovery. Yeah, and, with and, and, and maybe not. And, and, and that's really, you can see it. I'm sure, Neil, tell me if I'm wrong, but I assume your daily dialogue with a lot of institutional, uh, particularly the shorter term managers, is directly focused on odds of stimulus. Blue wave now equals big stimulus. I hear this from every single person. They're like, why do you do your job, Keith? Just buy stocks because big stimulus is coming. There, it's not about rate of change of the cycle. It's not rate of change of the profits. And if it is, it is because it is. In other words, they know that the cycle's slowing. They know that Citigroup today reported what they reported and that J.P. Morgan overstated their loan loss reserves um, the wrong way. You know, isn't, isn't that the, the thing that we're looking at, right? Just like in October of 08, everyone's begging for the same thing at the same time. I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, the, uh, the biggest reason why we're seeing this current surge over the past, I don't know, what, five, six days uh, yeah. 
is, uh, is Trump's horrendous debate performance. I actually looked at tapes of a whole bunch of undecided voters on Trump. And many of these people, two thirds of them, these are Obama to Trump switcherees, right? The people who switched in 2016. And there was this friend of mine who does, you know, opinion poll monitoring. He wants to know where these people are going. And he showed me about 30 of these people talking. And they all, even the pro-Trump one, agreed that, you know, Trump just looked horrible in that debate. I mean, that was just a huge. And what happened is, is that you see that the sudden widening of the, of the, of the opinion polls uh, and then Trump, you know, then he got sick, then he bowed out of the next debate, and so we're not going to have any more of those. But, but basically, this is, I think, behind what the market is doing, and it's directly tied to your expectation. I think, you know, normally the market likes a divided government, right? I mean, that's the mantra we've been saying for a long time, right? Divided government doesn't do any harm to the markets. You know, they're unlikely to do all these stupid things that, that government always does. I think that's shifting now, and I think right now, the market actually is looking for a concerted government that can pass, you know, some version of the HEROES Act and so on. And we're going to have enormous stimulus, Keith. I mean, that's that's yeah. what that's their expectation anyway. That's big time their expectation. It only takes a dollar up day like today to knock that back on its on its rocker for a little bit. I guess uh, last question for you for you on, yeah. on that, John, because you mentioned it because. People will just like, I'm wearing a blue jacket talking about blue waves. Neil's uh, agreeing with me on that point. But you, you mentioned this thing, like there, there's this thing called the Senate still. I mean, you know, there's a, you know, is it a given, do you think, or do you think that it's a given the other way, that the Senate, that it isn't a, a full-blown blue wave, and that would be a check and a balance on, on everything that we've been talking about? I'll let Neil go first, well, and then know. I'll disagree. <laughs> well, I know you. No, no, no. I, I know you disagree. Actually, I don't. I, I know Neil's answer to this question. I, I, what I want to hear is the other uh, answer, John, because you're the one. You're the. You're the one that isn't well, saying what Wall I, Street's saying. If, Most people on Wall Street aren't going to say what if, you're going to say if, next. If we, if Trump loses by more than the margin of error, then it's very likely that, uh, we lose. The Republicans lose the Senate. And that's problematic. Now, coming back to something Needle and I talked about just right before, I'm not certain, because that brings up the concept of packing the court, just like FDR tried in 37, and he couldn't get anywhere close to, he couldn't get enough of his own party to agree to pack the court. I don't think that Schumer can hold 52 Democrats to agree that to changing the rules that much they might agree to changing the filibuster but it's going to be hard now they could do it but well, you know I just, but it's it's going to be eh. just a little bit of history on that john yeah uh the reason why he didn't ultimately obviously the public turned against him despite the fact that he had this tremendous victory in 1936 right he was writing this overwhelming victory. I mean, the Republican Party, there's practically nothing left of it in Congress. And so he came in and he just said, wait a second, there's only one thing that's standing in the way of the, you know, AIA and the NRA and all these things I'm passing, right, our interpretation of the Commerce Clause, the nine old men, and particularly the four horsemen of reaction. <laughs> so what happened was, is that two of them died conveniently, and then a couple of others started changing their votes. And this was famously called the switch in time, save nine. Right? So they yeah. started switching their interpretation of the Commerce Clause. And they kind of said, OK, well, you know, Social Security doesn't really get, you know, violate the Tenth Amendment and all that. They started changing. And at that point, the Democrats said, you know, it's OK. We've kind of put them in their place. And it's very interesting, actually, to know whether John Roberts and some of the people that you forget the Supreme Court doesn't like to see itself as another political weapon. They're worried about their legitimacy. And it's one of the reasons why Roberts is often dis, you know, siding with uh, the liberals on the court, because he doesn't want the Supreme Court to be viewed as this, this partisan tool. So you remember the Supreme Court, these justices are looking down the road, you know, a decade or two. What's going to be left of this institution after all these current politicians are out of office? 
And I think it's an interesting question, actually, how they will actually vote. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to say one thing, because I know our time is coming up, Keith, and I hear your pressure. The most interesting thing about putting uh, Kavanaugh on the bench and then adding Amy Co uh, Cohen Barrett will be that Roberts might revisit what I think is one of the worst decisions of the last century was the Chevron decision by the Burger Court. <laughs> And 99% of the uh, listeners out there are going, their faces are going blank. But it's the one which allows a federal bureaucracy to make the rules, judge the rules, and pros uh, prosecute the rules and be the judge without appeals to a federal judge. I mean, you're in, there are a lot. Now, it, most people in America would say, well, of course you should be able to appeal to a judge. Uh, that could get, given the make the new the new makeup that is the one real thing that could really change things i don't think any of the other social things that they're all worried about i don't think that changes chevron makes a huge difference in the way this country is structured because if bureaucracies know they've got a judge looking over their cor uh, shoulder they start ruling differently and that's significant. Yeah, I, I would put it too, just I think Chevron actually raises a very fundamental issue, constitutional issue. How much authority can the Congress give away to the executive? <laughs> you know, can can Congress just tell the EPA, do anything you want regarding the, uh, the, the environment? You know, create any rules, create a whole infrastructure, you make all the decisions. No, at some point, the courts come in and say, you can't delegate all of your discretion but that's not what rate. but it's not what the chevron case it's, no it's, did. it's related <laughs> it's related to chevron because it allows the chevron's own administrative law courts to judge everything right it allows them, right the epa's lost yeah. exactly but that's the difference it's the two are related it's how much authority can congress delegate away and that uh, that will be the big the that will be the big change in 2021 watch it yeah I and agree. and and keith i know you've got to pull us off but thank <laughs> you it's you know well, what 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 the listeners don't know is that neil and i probably spend twice a month where we promise each other we're going to talk for 30 minutes and then three hours later we hang up and we've been doing this for a decade or more and you know we get together with our families and we get together when we can so these conversations that we're having now, this is this is what we do for our. This is what we do for fun. <laughs> it's awesome. You that's know that's true. that's how that's how. And this is the whole point of the investing summit is to, you know, not only educate or help educate people that are that are watching these conversations, but we're trying to educate ourselves. That's that's why we're that that's why we're, you know, that's why we're talking. We don't just randomly talk to random people. I mean, it's if you want to know, like. Neil, you just pulled that out of your wherever. You just pulled that 1936, you know, the the nine guy thing. I, I learned that, that was new. That was new to me. Holy man! And I'm supposed to I'm supposed to know that stuff. That was cool. Yeah, I mean, if you want it, like yeah. he, that guy could forget more on the way to the bathroom, Neil Howe, than most human beings ever will be able to remember. And it's, <laughs> and it's it's awesome, you know. Like and and truly, thank you for your both because again, we did lose you know power brain. We, the brain power is too big. We started a little late, but now we get to end a little later as a result. But thank you. Uh, thanks for doing this format. I, I was looking forward to it, and it worked out great. Thanks. Keith, thank you for inviting me. Neil, thank you. It was a, it's been a blast. <laughs> I agree. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. The threesome. I hope you liked it. We'll see you tomorrow.